This is an introductory video to the Bible's prophecy about our particular years from 1960 to 2041. It's in Matthew 25, 10 through 12, which you see in Greek on the screen, because that's how you figure out what the time period is. And I'm saying all this up front. It's going to sound goofball and weirdo and all the rest of it. After I do this introduction, I will go through the vetting process to show you that it's not goofball. It's part of a rhetorical style the Bible employs only in the original language texts, starting in Genesis 1. I've done a lot of videos on this over the last eight years. I discovered this technique eight years ago. It's a specific syllable counting rhetorical style to know prophecy and also to recount history for people who are learning the Bible orally at that point. They didn't have computers. They didn't have um, books. They had really heavy scrolls and it was too much trouble for them to learn that way. So what they did is they memorized that was a law that God set about in Deuteronomy 6 and 30, that they would assemble three times a year, hear scripture taught, hear, hear it read aloud, and they were supposed to memorize it. And then, of course, talk about it every single day for the rest of their lives. And you can go read that in Deuteronomy 6 and 30. So the question is, how did they learn it? They learned it by syllable counts, and the Bible employs syllable counts to help you understand the text. One of the functions of these syllable counts is to give you an annual, annual timeline going both backward and forward. Forward, of course, would be prophecy. Backward, of course, would be history. And this is a, a rhetorical style of syllable counting. One syllable equals one year that the Bible has employed ever since Genesis 1, which is going backwards, and then Psalm 90, which was written the same year, because one of the functions of syllable counting is to tell you when each Bible book was written. Psalm 90 is written the same year, and it goes backwards just like Genesis 1 does, and then it goes forward. But you can't see that from the text. You can only see it from the syllable counts, and the syllable counts interact with the text to help you understand the specific text you're looking at, as well as a timeline that relates to that text. In other words, a first line of Genesis 1, all right, has a timeline to it. It's not telling you when the earth began. That's what it's not doing. What it is doing is Moses is explaining why are we where we are, are now, and he's writing it when he's 119 years old. The syllable counting tells you that also. Why are we here poised to go into the land? It's not about how old the earth is. It's explaining the juridical purpose of the Jewish people. Now that's a big difference in focus. Okay? Same thing for Matthew 24 and 25. Matthew 25, 10 through 12 is specifically covering the period of 1960 to 2041 AD. Church, just like Israel, gets an annual timeline. In church's case, it's a what if the rapture doesn't happen timeline. But it's based on the same principles as all these syllable counting timelines in the Old Testament. And so far I've found five of them. Genesis 1, Psalm 90, Daniel 9, uh, I mean before Daniel, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9, and then um, I didn't actually find this one, somebody else is working on it right now, Zephaniah 1. There are timelines probably everywhere. In the Old Testament, I just, you know, I can only live so long. I'm 63 now, so I won't be able to get to them all before I die. But there are 30 characteristics to these timelines so that you can pick up any Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New, 
pick up any section of scripture and examine it for whether a timeline or whether the day, you know, this meter, I call it meter, exists. And um, there'll be a link in the video description that covers those 30 characteristics. So if you're familiar with Hebrew or Greek, you can go find them yourself. Okay? And some other people who read those characteristics, they're finding them in other passages. All right? This particular one in Matthew 24, 25, which is on screen, Matthew 25, was found by somebody who's in Frank Forum. His name is Anoni Nominon. We worked with it since February. And right now what you're seeing on screen is the current version of it. The screen is going to stay static. Okay? Because, you know, it's Greek and it's crazy and I want to explain the structure of it as an introduction. You can download the document. A link to downloading it will be in the video description. And you can vet it yourself. Okay? This is all independently verifiable. But there's going to be certain aspects of it that you'll want to challenge. And I do encourage you to be skeptical. So now I'm going to go back to the main point again. Matthew 25, 10 through 12 is covering the period 1960 to 2041. Now if you look over to the third column, well, yeah, third column technically speaking, you'll see at the end of Matthew 25, 9, the number 1929. You are to add 30 to that because the date line for this passage, which I'll cover in future videos, is 30 A.D. Christ is talking in 30 A.D. Matthew uses the conventional form of what's called a date line. It's a formula based on numbers of years prior and post. Okay, that's divisible by seven in order to tell you what date Christ is talking. And, of course, you can know from the text that he's talking two weeks before he dies. But it's 30 AD. There's other ways to verify that in the Matthew, actual Matthew, syllable counting of the text. So, all we had to do was count the syllables. So, by the time you get to the 1929th syllable, the year that that is, is 1929 years after Christ dies. So that would be 1959, and it is 30 A.D., not 33 A.D., okay? And I'll have to explain that later, but it has to do with an error in the Roman calendar. The Roman calendar has a four-year error in it, which mirrors the error that we have with our B.C. A.D., and that's pretty much why we have that problem today. But what I want to focus on it's the end of Matthew 25, 9. You'll see the number 1929. Add 30 to that, and that tells you what A.D. year it is. So then, beginning at Matthew 25, 10, is 1960. Now, if you're not familiar with the Greek, I'll just give you a sort of overview of the translation. Basically, what Matthew 25 begins saying is, as the foolish virgins were leaving the bridegroom, Christ, arrives. Now think about that. They're in the act of leaving to go buy oil because their lamps were running out. And that verse with the lamps running out, that was when World War I started. So it's a very biting sarcasm. So they're going to go and buy oil as they're leaving. While they're in the act of leaving, that's the meaning in the Greek that you don't see in the English. Well, maybe in some translations. The bridegroom comes. Now, in the ancient world, when a bridegroom comes, it's not quiet. There's lots of singing and dancing and playing of the tambourines and flutes and whatever their stringed instruments were. It would make a lot of noise. So how come these foolish virgins. They're not called bridesmaids, they're called virgins. How come they don't hear that the bridegroom is coming? That's your first big clue as to the satirical value of this text beginning in 1960. That clause ends in 1976. You'll see it says 1946. 
is 1976 because you add 30. You're always adding 30. So that's your first big hint that Christians cannot hear the Lord come. Now, what does it mean to say the Lord come? Well, you have to kind of know the Old Testament for that. That goes back to number six. The Lord came to Moses. And Moses saw him face to face and therefore had to wear a veil. God comes to you when you're studying him. God comes to you when you're talking to him. God comes to you. I mean, it's sort of a metaphor because God's everywhere. God comes to you when you're learning him. All right? God came and talked to Moses face to face. That's where it's coming from. Is number six idea. God comes to you whenever you're learning him, talking to him. You know, then you're face to face with God. Because God's everywhere, first of all. And because you want to come to him. So the bridegroom is coming to where the foolish virgins are. And they don't hear him. They don't see him. And they're leaving at the same time he's coming. So something's wrong with them. All right? Something's really wrong with them. That's your first big clue that this is a condemnation of Christians. Matthew 25 begins with 50-50 split of Christians. And Matthew 25, 1 starts, or actually the end of that first clause, is in 1703. A.D. Okay? No, it begins at 1703 A.D., sorry. So we're talking about history of Christians from 1703 A.D. and then down at Matthew 25, 12, when the parable ends, it's 2041 A.D. So he's Christ is telling you what the history of the world is as a result of Christians being in the world the whole doctrine of the salt you know you're the salt of the earth that's a doctrine that started in Genesis okay it's famously encapsulated in Deuteronomy 32 8 and um, Acts 1740 26 in the New Testament you know and then of course Christ talking in the gospel saying you're salt of the earth there's an actual annual timeline about how the salt affects history that starts in Genesis 1 and goes all the way through Revelation. All right. Now, the Matthew 24-25 part of it ends at 3250 AD, assuming there's no rapture. I do not yet know if Revelation or John or any other book of the Bible goes past that date. You know, if I live long enough, I'll find out. Maybe somebody else will find it out, too. I don't know. But right now, we're working with time up to 30 to 50 AD, and we're specifically concerned with 1960 to 2041, because that's our time. You're always supposed to know what time it is. The Hebrew word for that is la moed. It meant appointments. And the Jews knew specifically when Christ would come. He was predicted to the very year through these timelines and then he was predicted to the very day in Haggai 2 which turned out to be Hanukkah he was born on Hanukkah and I've done the videos on that in Vimeo um, and in YouTube just look for Lord born on Hanukkah and with my name brain out or brain outy alright so we come back Matthew 2510 opens the text with as the foolish virgins were leaving, the bridegroom comes. And it's like, what the heck is wrong with those virgins that they couldn't hear him come? Because if he's coming, then they don't have to worry about going and buying oil. Which means they didn't care. Or they weren't listening. Which means they were negative to his coming. Now, we're just talking about the text now, not the year. Just the text tells you right away that if as they're leaving, he comes, how come they don't know? Okay? There's no way they couldn't know. Be too much noise being made by the bridegroom's party. You could hear them from blocks away. How come they don't know? Big warning sign. Negative believers not filled with the Spirit in the dark 
1 John 1 8, 1 John 1 10. So we're talking negative believers. Okay, so now we look at the timeline. And at the beginning of Matthew 25 10, there on the screen, the very beginning of that verse is 1960, because the end of the prior verse is 1959, 1929 plus 30. So the beginning of the verse is the following year. I do not know what fiscal year it is. I don't know if it's the Jewish fiscal that begins, you know, on the vernal equinox, or if it's the Jewish fiscal year that begins at the autumnal equinox. Okay, or if it's Christ's own year, which of course he's born on Hanukkah, that was really what December 25 used to be. Um... And yes, it did coincide with the Saturnalia. Paul made a joke about that fact in Galatians 4.4 4 in the Greek. Greek name word Kronos is the Greek name for the Roman god Saturn. And the Saturnalia was the festival for the end of the year. So you can go look that up. The point is that Christ was born on Hanukkah. I don't know if the fiscal year he's got in mind for 1960 is his fiscal year, the calendar year, which by the time he was talking, that what we call the calendar year had already been instituted and had been in place since Caesar in 44 BC. I don't really know which fiscal. So for lack of better you know, proof, let's call it the calendar year as we know it, but it might not be. 1960. What happened that made Christians go negative in 1960? Well, in the United States, and there's a reason why we want to focus on the United States, which I'll cover in future videos, but in the United States there was one guy, Jerry Falwell Sr. Well, actually not just him, but primarily him. He got ticked off that Christian values were not being used in Washington. So he started in line with Richard Nixon climbing up in politics. He started the silent majority. And it wasn't just him. It was a bunch of guys like him who, you know, all of a sudden the Bible wasn't good enough for them. They had to politicize Christianity. Now, I don't know if you're too familiar with the Bible, but the Bible always condemns religion. And it always condemns unifying religion and politics. Always. Of course, the most famous example is Revelation 17. But it was condemned in the Old Testament, too. Go look at Ezekiel 16. In those days, religion was orgy. Religion was temple prostitutes, and your way of being with God was to do it with a temple prostitute. And God was condemning that then. And that's why his, the language is so lewd. It's, it's really very, very lewd in Ezekiel 16. When my pa pastor exegeted that passage, he lost half the congregation or more. He likes to tell, when he was still alive, he liked to tell that story. He said the congregation went down to like 35 people because they didn't like the, you know, the language. But it's the Bible, okay? In the old days, they had religion by means of orgies. All right. In later times, they became ascetic. All right. So the Bible has always condemned the unification of polity of po you know politics and religion the unity of church and states always condemned that mosaic law always separated church and state and of course so does our constitution so the bio so christ is beginning to tell you a condemnatory thing which you know right away because as the foolish virgins foolish virgins are leaving the bridegroom comes the foolish virgins are leaving. The wise ones aren't leaving. The foolish ones are leaving. And they don't hear the bridegroom come? Big warning. 1960, that's what was happening in Christianity specifically, and especially in the U.S., but other countries of the world were, you know, aping themselves after the U.S. And we started, when I say we, I mean Christianity in the United States, we started to politicize then. 
we weren't really political before. And I remember, even as a kid, you know, I was like seven years old in 1960, um, when I started to get older, a couple of years older, my parents started to politicize too. Okay? And by the time I was in high school, the John Birch Society was all the rage. All right, that was political. Okay. Politicizing of Christianity is what started in 1960, principally under Jerry Falwell, but not merely him. And you can go look that up. Just look up Jerry Falwell. You know, it's, it's in Wikipedia, the silent majority. And it became the silent majority under Nixon. And that took a cup, you know, up to like 1968 when he started to get elected. And then, or was running for office. And then, um, then it became known as the moral majority under Reagan. And then it morphed again. I forget into what its name was under the Bushes. Okay. And then, of course, Jerry Falwell Sr. died in the meantime. And Liberty University had been founded. And now Jerry Falwell is a big supporter of Donald Trump. Totally political Christianity. Tea Party has happened in the meantime. All that other junk. Okay. Politicizing a fetus, which the Bible never does. That's what is being warned of in this passage. As the foolish virgins are leaving, the bridegroom comes. And then that ends at 1976, which is when Ronald Reagan started to rise. Okay, you know, after Nixon had already, you know, fallen and everything. Ronald Reagan started to rise in 1976. There are a bunch of other really important changes in Christendom that occurred that year. A bunch of really important things that also occurred with respect to um, the problems with Russia and the problems with um, the Cold War and all that other stuff. that are sort of coming to fruition now. 1976 was a pivotal year and Gerald Ford was the nominee then but it but as he was speaking and getting the nomination everybody realized they should have nominated Reagan Reagan took advantage of the Falwell thing and Falwell took advantage of Reagan and that's how Reagan won in 1980 and by then it was called the moral majority All right but 1976 you'll see in the you know, because you're seeing the static screen. Matthew 25, 10. The first clause of it, because it's broken by clauses. You have to do the parsing by clause. Is 1976. It'll say 1946 on the screen. That's when it became the moral majority. And then the next clause is that the wise virgins go in with the bridegroom and he shuts the door. At the end of that clause you'll see in the far, farther to the right is 1968 which is 1998 AD. Now here's what's really provocative about that. Of course 1998 Bill Clinton was still in office but George Bush was campaigning or starting to campaign and that was when the you know the Christian right was really trying to get you know a Republican back in office and one of the principal things that was interesting about that campaigning was that you know Roe versus Wade had already been passed in 1973 which is a lot of the reason why um, Ronald Reagan took advantage of the so-called moral majority idea. But in 1998, in particular, you had a number of things that were already beginning to happen that are now a staple of everyday life. You had the first couple of instances of terrorism. You know, I don't know if people remember, but the first attack on the World Trade Center was 1995. And in 1995, Bill Clinton knew about bin Laden, but they didn't have enough information to really say for sure that he was behind it. They should have had enough information. There was a lot of stuff going on there. And of course, you know, the whole terrorism thing really kind of began with Jimmy Carter back in 1976. And during Reagan, of course, too. 
So you have that, those threads starting. Now the Bible tells you that when stuff like that happens, Christendom is apostate. And that's in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So Christ is depending on the reader counting the syllables to know what year it is because it's the same style he's using the same style that Moses used in Hebrew okay and then Isaiah used and Daniel used um, and then of course Mary used it in Greek in the Magnificat I already did videos on that they're in Vimeo um, so it's a question of you know like why why is this period so bad well, it's bad because the Christians are foolish. You got 50% of the Christians not being filled with the Spirit. That's bad. Judgment has to come. And we already know the principles. And he's depending on you knowing the principles from Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Which says, if you don't, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to send judgment in successive waves, five successive waves. And the fourth and the fifth wave, if you go read the text, is economic problems and then invasion. And terrorism is a kind of invasion. So when the Lord shuts the door with the, you know, the wise virgins in 1998 AD, which is 1968 in the meter, that's basically like the ceiling s-e-a-l-i-n-g of the believers in revelation 7 before the tribulation at the moment the tribulation starts the people who suddenly convert as a result of the tribulation starting the 144,000 jewish evangelists named by tribe it's like they're being protected sealed means protected all right, you're sealed the minute you believe in Christ. But sealing also means protected. The Lord has his seal on you, S-E-A-L. It's a sign of ownership. Okay, Paul likes to call it arabon, um, meaning, uh, uh, what do you want, down payment in Ephesians 1.14. So to say that the believers, the wise virgins are sealed, because the door shuts, that's, a, you know, you're, you're with him, intimately with him, shutting the door so nobody else can get in. All right, that's saying that the wise ones get sealed off and protected from what's going to happen next. All right, and what does happen next? All right, at this point, you're looking at, you know, 19... 1998 which is 1968 and see the the word you can't if you can read the Greek you'll see the word is Tura and that means door that's 1998 so the beginning of verse 11 is 1999 okay Usteronda later on So from 1998 until 2001, 1999 to 2001, that's encompassed by the words "husteronda," my badly pronounced Greek, which in English is easily translated later on. So there's a hiatus. There's a sort of like gap. And the Bible favors three and a half year gaps. He uses that, that a lot, and I cover that in my videos, especially in the Vimeo channel, because I've been doing this for a long time. And so there's a little hiatus of three, three years, maybe three and a half years. Okay, well, September 11th, 2001, under Bush, who just been elected in 2000, takes office in January of 2001. Uh oh. Later on. I hope you get the satire of this. 
later on the foolish virgins return yep they returned with Bush and Bush kept saying this is the killer George Bush kept saying he and his wife both they were attacked and attacked and attacked by Christians wanting some kind of pro-life ruling some kind of pro-life law that forbids abortion and George and his wife Laura kept on saying America is not ready for that later on. We're not ready for that now. America is not ready yet. That's the actual quote. You can Google on it. Just George W. Bush or Laura Bush. America is not ready yet. That was in their website. I saw it myself. And a lot of people complained about that. And that's why you should Google later on. Later on, the foolish virgins come back. Yeah, under Bush. And later on, after Bush, comes Obama. And oh boy, all the foolish virgins are up in arms over Obama being in office. And that's when the Tea Party got started. Later on, the foolish virgins actually the text doesn't quite say it that way the text says later on came back the remainder it doesn't even call them foolish the remainder of the virgins at the beginning of the word virgins that's 2009 and then they say when they come back isn't that cute the virgins come back 2009 is where the word virgin begins in the Greek. Of course, that's when the Tea Party started. And the next word in the Greek is, and they said, or saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. Okay, the first Lord in the Greek is our year 2016. What is everybody saying about Trump? This is so embarrassing, I could die. They're calling him Lord. Trump called himself God several times. The most notable is when he's at Liberty University and he twists 2 Corinthians 3.17 to reverse its meaning. And yet nobody in Liberty University, not even Jerry Falwell Jr., figured that out. If you look at Donald Trump's speeches, pick the C-SPAN one in YouTube, it's about, I think, three, minute, three minutes and 17 seconds. Within the first minute of that clip, Donald Trump says, I will protect Christianity. The verse says, only the Holy Spirit protects you. So it doesn't matter what kind of government you have, because where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. But Donald Trump asserts that he will protect Christianity, so he's replacing God. The minute I heard that clip, I thought, oh wow, God's flying a blimp in the sky. He's doing his own sky writing, saying never Trump. Because the whole chapter is all about how it doesn't matter what form of government you live under. The Holy Spirit assures your freedom no matter what. So you never have to rebel against any kind of government you have. If you're in communist China, don't worry about it. God will ensure your freedom. And besides, the communist Chinese don't care anymore so long as you don't use it to rebel against them. And Romans 13 through 15 says that you should never rebel against authority. That whoever's in, whoever's in control of your country, God put them there. Don't worry about it. Okay? And then you have the story of Daniel, where, you know, Daniel kept on praying and nobody did anything to him. Or, they tried to do something to him and it didn't work. So, same thing's going to be true for you. So, of course, what that means, in Second Corinthians 3, especially verse 17, is you do not repeat do not politicize Christianity. Christ told Pilate, 
John 18.36, my kingdom is not of this world. Oh, but here we are, Matthew 25.11 at that first Lord. And they're talking to the false bridegroom. They're trying to make Donald Trump Lord. Unless you think I'm exaggerating. Go into, you, go into YouTube and type Donald Trump anointed or type Seven Mountains Lance Walnau W-A-L-L-N-A-U He talked to Trump. He visited Trump. He told Trump that Trump was the anointed one and actually compared Trump to Cyrus in Isaiah 45. It's totally stupid. And Ann Coulter in Amazon wrote a book called In Trump We Trust. And then Rick Wilson invented the name Cheeto Jesus. And you have all kinds of people saying that, oh, Trump is the anointed one. God is in favor of Trump. That stems from, you know, you can look at Rush Limbaugh or what you might call it, Pat Robertson or any of these so-called Christian leaders. They're all treating Trump as if he's God. Lord, Lord, open up to us. And of course, the Greek word kyrie, which is the word in that passage, is two syllables, not three, is used to speak of any high official, specifically God, but not merely God. But idea is, oh, you're our Lord. Really? False bridegroom. Politics is always a false bridegroom. That's the point of scripture. That's what God's always telling you. But Christians don't care. They all politicize a fetus, even though God never did. And since 1960, that's what they've done. So there you go. Lord, open up to us. Yeah, they're calling on the wrong Lord. The real Lord already shut the door back in 1998. But these foolish virgins, they can't tell. So they're calling on a false Lord. Open up to us. They think they're so foolish, they're so insane, that they think that God should run based on politics. And that if they politicize Christianity, that that's holy. Go look up seven mountains in either Google or YouTube. And look up the word dominionism in either Google or YouTube and listen to these people talk. Ted Cruz's own dad belongs to this movement. Ted Cruz happily, thank God, disavowed it in his Wednesday speech when he said vote your conscience at the last, you know, Wednesday on the at the Cleveland RNC convention. I was really worried that he was going to buy into it like his dad did, but he doesn't. His speech proves that. So I feel really good about that. But the Seven Mountains Dominionism crowd, that's all of what are called the evangelicals. They think they're going to bring Christ back. They call it the Seven Mountains of Power. You know, communication and politics and business. And I forget what the other ones are. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. But yet Christ said, John 18.36 again, My kingdom is not of this world. But there you have staring in front of you, the word is Kyrie, Q-U-R-I-E. The R looks like a P in Greek. That first one is 2016. That's our year. Totally ignoring Christ. That's the whole point of that passage. Now, it goes on. Lord, Lord, open up to us. By the time it gets to the open up to us, that the end of that, okay, that's listed as 1993, and then you add 30 to that, and that makes it 2023. That's how long this is going to go on. So the apostasy in Christendom, politicizing Christianity, doesn't stop. Now, I can't tell you, I cannot tell you from that text whether or not Donald Trump wins. But whether or not he wins... Christians will keep on politicizing. 
And then when you go to verse 12, by the time it ends, you'll see it says 2011 in the syllable counts at the far right. That's, you add 30, that's 2041. That's when he finally, the Lord, the real Lord, opens up the door and says, get this, I don't know you. Of course he knows them. You have to understand the, the culture at the time. In, in, when you talk to a, a seminarian or a pastor or a Bible theologian, they'll tell you that this is isagogics. That's a technical term for interpreting the text in the time that it was written with respect to the culture at the time it was written. So you can interpret what it meant at the time it was written. At the time it was written, when somebody opened up a door and said, I don't know you, but they clearly did, that's a form of disavowal. That's a form of repudiation. That's a form of condemnation. Which means that the condemnation of these politicizing Christians will go on until some kind of stop end occurs in 2041. Now, when God stops something, it means that he's judged. It means a whole lot of these Christians are going to die. You won't know which ones are bad and which ones are good as they die. Because, you know, they each person when you die, you get your report card from God at death. And it's not going to be visible to others. You know, God is, what do you want to call it, gracious. You know when you die. But nobody else does. Okay? So you can die in a way that looks horrible, or you can die in a way that looks peaceful. That's no indication of whether or not you are a good Christian when you die. None at all. Because Christ died on a cross. Alright? He died a horrible death. So you can't say that a person who dies a horrible death was a bad Christian. You also can't say everybody dying a horrible death was a good Christian. Okay, because a lot of good Christians die peacefully and a lot of bad Christians die peacefully. The point is that they will die. It's like the 40 years in the wilderness. 2001, when we first were invaded, to 2041 is 40 years. 1960, again, it depends on the fiscal. 1960. To 2041 is meant to be 40 years. All right, there's a, a fiscal year issue there. All right, it might be a little bit longer than 40, but not fully 41. It might be a rounding issue, and I, I, right now, I can't tell you what the fiscal year is that the Lord is using. That, that's one of the many things we have to figure out with this passage. But you'll notice the symmetry. It's just like. Egypt. When Israel went to Egypt, it went in the middle of two 40-year periods during which Joseph was ruling. At the end of the first 40 years, the last seven of them were the seven fat years. And then the next seven years were the seven lean years. And then um, Jacob and his family is coming in the middle of it. And the total number of years that Joseph ruled was 80. It's a parallel to that, but I'm not 100% sure if that particular parallel to Pharaoh's dream and the 80 years of Joseph is intended. I have to do more study on that. But it is an 80-year period, and it is split into two forties, so that's evocative of Pharaoh's dream. I'm not sure if that's the right interpretation. It's a you know, possibility I have to learn. Maybe one of you will learn it. Okay, and tell me. But anyway, it ends at, at the 40 years wandering, as it were, in the wilderness, where, you know, Israel was judged when she was going into the land. It took her 40 years to do it because, the because you know, Numbers 14, God said, well, I'll just destroy everybody and start over with you, Moses. And Moses says, no, don't do that because Pharaoh will hear, hear about it. And then God says to him, okay, well, then they're going to wander around for 40 years, and I'm going to kill them off that way. That's what's happening to us now. And it ends at 2041. 
and isn't going to be necessarily clear on a like macro scale that all the bad Christians are getting killed off. He's going to do it slowly or quickly. But the idea is just like with the Exodus, for those of us who are around all these apostate Christians to have enough time to be inoculated against their apostasy. And how do I know that? Because the next clause, Matthew 25, 13, right there on your screen. And you know, you can look up your translation if you don't like the Greek. But you need the Greek in order to see the counts, the syllable counts. You'll notice that next clause is 20 years long. 20 syllables equals 20 years. And it starts out with Grigorete, be alert. You don't know when. He's reminding them that the rapture could occur. That's always true in that whole passage. Okay, but if it doesn't occur, then you're going to be alive and you need to know what the history is going to be like. So you know what to learn from it in advance. That's why we have prophecy, to learn the lessons from it. And then if you're alive during that particular time, then the lessons are much more specific to you. So, Grigorete, be alert, Matthew 25, 13. You don't know when it's going to happen. All right, that 20-year period is, and this is going to be very complicated. I did videos on this already, but I got to do more. That 20-year period is reserved for the 120 years that occurs every 430 years with the Arabs, with the Muslims breaking out. They broke out in 638 A.D., 1071 or 1073 A.D., 1517 A.D., and 19, according to the Bible, 1941 rather than 1947. The 120 years is 10, you know, 2061. It looks like um, 2031 in the text. The syllable count is 2031 after Christ dies. That's to take care of the Muslim swarm. And I did videos on that already in YouTube. The title of the playlist is How Satan Deploys Islam for the past years that I was talking about. And then the 2061, it seems to be based on 120 year, four generations, count from 1941 when World War II began. And it began in large measure due to trying to wipe out the Jews. That was how Hitler got it started. That was his whole game plan. Wipe out the Jews. Take over Europe. Make it for a pure Aryan race. Wipe out all the Slavs, all the Gypsies, all the gays, all the communists, and especially all the Jews. So it looks like the Bible is dating that from 1941 rather than 1947 when Israel, of course, um, was just becoming a state after the World War II ended. Now that four generation curse is, you know, goes all the way back to Noah in you know, 120 years. But you can also argue that it applies very specifically to Islam. First of all, because you just those dates I gave you measure it 120 years after each one, each one of those dates. And you'll find that the swarm ends. It's not exactly 120 years each time. You know, like the Battle of Tours was, I want to say, 722 with Charles Martel. So that was before 120 years from 638, okay, to Charles Martel. So maybe you, you could argue it a little bit longer because the Jews were, I mean, the Muslims were still in Spain, but they couldn't get any farther north due to the Battle of Tours. And then you go 120 years after 1071, 1073, because each of these dates relates to... Um, a takeover at Jerusalem. 638, that's when they first went to Jerusalem. 1071 or 1073, I forget which. They went to Jerusalem the second time. 1517, they went to Jerusalem the third time. And of course, that coincided with the fall of Constantinople. Um, well, not coincided exactly, but I was, you know, related. And that also coincided with um, the 10, you know, the 95 Theses by Luther. It was very interesting. But it was an invasion of Jerusalem, too. And then, of course, you got 1941 or 1947, however you want to look at it. So it's not always evenly 120 years. 
that they swarm. But it is almost evenly 430 years each time. And that's Satan playing on Exodus 12, 40 and 41. Because the whole concept of Islam is Exodus. The whole book of the Quran is a sort of burlesque of the Exodus. And their term for Exodus is called Hejira. And that's how they began. That they deemed their year one of the Hijra, their Exodus, at 622 AD. So it's it's orchestrated. And of course the Arabs don't know that. But you can prove it with history. Now what's really interesting about that is that a guy named Sir John Glubb, G-L-U-B-B, -B, you can get this in Amazon, he wrote a book which I had to read as part of my college syllabus called A Shorter History of the, a the Arab Peoples. And the book that I had in the 1970s is still available in Amazon. So you can get it. It's a really good book. He loves the Arabs, so he's not being critical. But in his appendix, he talks about this 120-year thing, how it was, seemed really odd to him, though. Every four generations or so, the Arab rulers sort of die out. He doesn't make any mention of scripture, or at least I don't remember him doing that. But I read the book like 40 years ago. I have a copy of it, but I haven't looked at it, you know, in the interim. But this gives you some sense of, oh, Christ is actually predicting something that you can measure in history already. So this being predictive makes sense. Now here's the next part about why I know that it's a wipeout of Christians and a wipeout of the Arabs. The next parable that he goes into is the parable of the talents. And I want you to pay real close attention to the ratios there. In the parable of the virgins, it was 50-50. In the parable of the talents, you got two good servants and one bad one. Two-thirds. But what is that telling you? That as a result of what's happening to us now, Christianity in the future will rebound and get more productive. That's the trend of history. And of course, that's the last parable in there. Because the very last part of Matthew 25 is the Lord physically coming back, separating the sheep and the goats, and you go into eternity. And that whole section is a, it would cover the millennium. All right? So then we go back. This is really what's so funny about this. If you go back to the Talmud, okay, and I, I don't have proof of this yet. I'm just guessing. But you go back to the Talmud, you know, Jewish Talmud, Sanhedrin, th this is a section in the Talmud. And if you don't know how to find it, ask a Jew. Sanhedrin uh, 97 through 99 has this sort of like treatise in there that says that there's 2,000 years allotted to the Goyim, 2,000 years allotted to the Jews, then Messiah comes, and yes, he did. It was actually 4103 from Adam's fall that he was born. And I did a genius.xls you know, to show you the whole timeline, because I started with the Genesis, you know, the Genesis begats, and I do the whole timeline all the way to, like, 6530, um, 6530 6, years, all right, or more, I think it's more. But, you know, 2,000 years for the Goyim, 2,000 years for the Jews, and then Messiah comes. That's what's in Sanhedrin 97 through 99. It's not really 2,000, it's 2,100. So 2,100 and 2,100 is 4,200. That was supposed to be the end of time. Messiah was supposed to be allotted 40 years of life. Okay, and that's in the Bible too. That's also in Sanhedrin 97 through 99. Because David had 40 years of rule, so Messiah had to be born a thousand years after David died. David died at age 77, not age 70. The Bible makes it clear that it was age 77 in 1 Kings 6 1, but oh my, the scholars used Josephus instead, so they missed that. The last seven chapters of 1 Chronicles are devoted to the last seven years of David, what he did during his last seven years after he retired. Solomon was already king. So four years after David died, 
is the eleventh year of Solomon, but the fourth year after David died, first Kings six one. Now if I haven't completely made your eyes glaze over. The point is that Christ therefore had to be born forty one oh three from Adam's fall in order to be born and die with the forty years allotted by the thousandth anniversary of David's death. And he did. That was his allotment. That's what Daniel 9 was mapping. Because Daniel 9 is a timeline too. Daniel 9 was mapping it. Isaiah 53 had already mapped it. And Daniel was tacking his timeline onto the timeline of Isaiah 53. Now I did videos on Isaiah 53 and Daniel 9 in Vimeo. You just look up Brain Out and Daniel 9 and Isaiah 53 in Vimeo and you'll find them. Because I mapped that out already. They're timelines, both of them, both of those chapters. And they tack onto the Moses timeline in Psalm 90. Moses did a timeline in Psalm 90 and Isaiah tacked onto it and Daniel 9 tacked onto the Isaiah timeline and the Mary and the Magnificat tacked onto Daniel's. Christ is tacking onto Mary's. But I haven't figured out quite why or how he's doing it yet. I know he is, but I have to figure that out. The point is, is that he was supposed to be born and was born 4103 in order for that timing to occur such that the millennium was supposed to begin 4200. See, 2,000 years for the Goyim, 2,000 years for the Jews, and then Messiah comes. Yeah, he did. But he comes a little bit before the end because he has to be allowed 40 years to live. Except he didn't actually live 40 years. He lived 33 years. So that's why there's a tribulation and the church rapture kicks it off. Because the end of the 62nd week in Daniel 9, 26 was when he was supposed to die. But he doesn't. He dies at the beginning of the 62nd week. And if you use lunar years, you miss it. If you use calendar years, if you use solar years like the Bible alone always uses... Then you realize, oh, wait a minute, there's seven years extra here. And that's why Christ is talking in Matthew 24 and 25. He's explaining that as a result of him dying early. Because he's going to die two weeks after he talks. That's in the next chapter, Matthew 26. As a result of him dying early, what's going to happen to history? That's why he's giving you the timeline of Matthew 24, 25. To know how history changes as a result of church. And during our period, 1960 to 2041, church is not doing so well. Half of us are apostate. And we politicize Christianity as a result. That's why I'm making these, this video. Alright, and then the next segment of history as a result of Christians dying out, the apostate ones, and as a result of the Arabs being quelled, as they usually are every 120 years after they swarm, and they swarm every 430 years, after, as a result of that, Christians are much more productive. So from 2062 onward, Christianity, such as it exists, or believers, because we might be in the millennium by then, Believers are much more productive. Two-thirds. Now, of course, if the millennium has started by then, then you and I will be coming back with the Lord. And either if you got your kingdom because you got crowned, that's First Timothy 4, 7, and 8. If you got crowned for super maturing, then you'll have your own kingdom on earth and you'll have some kingdom off earth to rule and then the people you'll be ruling over they will still be in their first life they won't have died yet and they're going to be learning from watching you rule if you didn't get awarded a kingdom from what I can tell so far it looks like you just sit on the sidelines or you're not even on earth I'm not 100% sure how to interpret that yet you know, everybody's got a different view about how that works. My pastor speculated that you sit on the sidelines, but he even he wasn't saying that you actually return to earth. You return that first time, 
you know, the Revelation 19, I think it's 19, where they're all riding on horses. We're all riding on horses at the second advent. Flying horses, that'll be fun. Okay, it sounds like the whole of church. But it doesn't mean the whole of church stays on earth during all that time. Maybe it does. I don't know. But the point is, is that, you know, there are only going to be a few who are rulers. And that's Revelation 1.6, Revelation 5.10, sarcastic version of it in first, what was it? First Corinthians 4, 7, and 8. And there are other passages too. Um, at the end of Romans 5, they will rule with him. So, the we, who's the we? Is it all of church or only some of church? Well, clearly it's not going to be the foolish virgins. Clearly you have to mature because Crown went to Paul. Obviously he super matured, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. So, you're going to have to be like that. And of course the crown can be over a large kingdom or a small kingdom. There are different versions of kings. Kings aren't all equal. But, you know, you can rule over Liechtenstein. And that's not necessarily small. It might be small in population. You know, I don't know, you know how the Lord's going to award it all. But, you know, most of us are not going to be kings. So, that timeline showing that Christianity becomes or believers maybe not Christianity you know because when we go back to the millennium it's all going to be it's you know Christ is on earth he's ruling as a Jew and you know the the Jews from the Old Testament and the New Testament they come back and the ones that are part of the millennium are from the Old Testament getting cities you know the parable about you rule over five cities, you rule over ten cities. And then you've got, you know, the people who were on earth during the tribulation, that's a return to Judaism too. Updated. All right. And so it's a new version of Judaism that you see in Ezekiel forty and following. You know, the new description of the new the new temple and all the rest of it. So we will be co rulers of the Gentile nations, but Israel will be queen of the nations then, headed by Christ. And then that's the, really 1050 years, not a thousand. It's really 1050 years, and then psh, that's the end. So the question is, where in this timeline to 3250 AD does that millennium begin? And you can just count back, and it just turns out if you count it back from 3250 A.D., okay, 3250 minus 1,000 is 2250 minus 50 is 2200 A.D. It could be that. It could be as literal as that. In which case, Sanhedrin, 97 through 99, 2,000 years for the Goyim, 2,000 years for the Jews, then Messiah comes, and then they say Messiah has his own 2,000. Maybe. It's really 2100, but, you know, round it off, yeah. Because a thousand is reserved for believers, and the last 50 years is a concerted harvesting of unbelievers. Concerted evangelism. That's how the, each historical period breaks down. Now we're coming to our own of that, depending on whether or not I'm analyzing, you know, the, the 1050 properly. It either started with Christ's birth, which Paul seems to be making it do, in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Or it starts with his, his death, which Christ seems to be making it do here in this Matthew 24, 25. I'm not sure yet. If it's based on his death, then our 2100 AD will be the end of the 1050, our last 1050. So we're now at 2015 and 2100 minus 50 would be 2050 would be when the 50 years the last 50 years of concerted evangelism begins which kind of makes sense then why the text is talking about two guys who are faithful and one guy who's stingy meaning that the evangelism 
of that period because it's beginning at 2060 now. All right, you can see how that fits. 2061 is where Matthew 25, 13 ends. Okay, Matthew 25, 14, which begins the next parable, is therefore starting at 2062 AD. Well, that's within the 50-year window to 2100. You can see why it would be that kind of window. You see why it's so important? And that would that would really make sense because we would want, you know, evangelization to be a lot more effective in the last 50 years because that's a concentrated period of evangelization. And he's basically, you know, kind of giving you hope. Don't worry about what you're going through now. It's all going to be used to build up greater faith in Christ later on. In other words, your life means something. It doesn't seem like it now, maybe. And it doesn't matter if the world doesn't know who you are. You learn and live on Bible under your right male-only teacher using when John 1, 9 is needed. Every day, just live to the Lord because you're being trained for eternity and you're being trained as salt of the earth right now. Do not politicize like all these dippy Christians are. You do not politicize Christianity. Just learn and live on Bible under your right male-only teacher using 1 John 1, 9 as needed. And God will grow you so that you might own a kingdom after you die. Peace out.